Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> boys and girls, <laughs> to the Wombo Combo Podcast. I'm Frankie CPK, joined by that guy, BSJ. Totally fresh here to start for a First Tuesday time. evening. I uh, know. We're happy to be here, though, on what's a, what's a Tuesday evening, a little bit later on, even in the night, than we're, we're used to doing things. But, you know, t- sometimes schedule changes, but we're making a point. Still going to be getting some content in for you guys to hopefully enjoy. So, of course, Frankie CPK, you're joined by BSJ, fresh back from Ukraine, as mentioned, the minor event. Once again, how you doing, buddy? Eh, you know, fresh is a loosely used term here. Fresh as in recently, yes. Uh, I just got done with like a 24-hour travel day, so okay. starts off with a four-hour bus ride, which was like, you know, 25 people inside of a small bus, so oh, geez. by no means was that the highlight, though. The event was really fun. Uh, even got to go skiing the day before the event started. So that was super cool. Never thought I'd ever ski in Ukraine. And uh, yeah. a lot of good Dota, a lot of good people there, and a lot of good food. So very, just an enjoyable event all around. So glad to be back, though, and get back into the Dota. I did miss playing Dota. A lot of great production as well, man. And again, I, I called it going in. Obviously, I've had the chance to work with those guys myself and a fun group of guys. Uh, and the reaction from the community, I'm not even just saying that myself. I mean, it got a lot of praise from the community, especially for a minor event. So as something tells me, it's not going to be the last time we see a see a we play tournament being hosted. So, yeah, well, it was you have fun working behind the scenes and everything. Yeah, yeah, no, the whole the whole thing was fun. I think the only issue everyone had was the fact that uh, it was all condensed so much that there was like five best of threes, five best of threes, and then the third day I had to start late with four best of threes. Yeah, and like we were starting to end at like three or five a.m. Uh, I think the entire thing was really well run, uh, except for that. Sure. So everything yeah. behind the scenes was really nice. Uh, you know, all the people working with us, the communication like service, like, you know, taking care of us and all that was great. Um, so it wasn't just on the surface. Sometimes in tournaments, uh, especially like TI, it can be really well produced or, you know, it looks really clean to the public, mm-hmm. but behind the scenes can be incredibly chaotic. But this time around, I'd say everything was as clean in the behind the scenes as it was on camera sure. so that was it was a nice pleasant tournament to be a part of i am glad you brought that up though because that that was definitely a little bit of a, a black eye of sorts i think you could say because I, I, I was feeling for you guys man i don't know if you had the late shift that night or if that was i know i remember lacoste being there as part maybe like lacoste and cinema were part of it i don't know if you're cast but you guys were up until like 4 or 5 a.m even local time that one night yeah fortunately for me i mean the thing is the only people that had it the worst was like Rich, who not only had to be up, but also oh, wow. had to do the first series the next day because hmm. um, they had less hosts, obviously, per thing than they did have casters and analysts. But I fortunately was always on the first through third series. So I kind of got like they purposely made everyone either be always night or always morning. So that was kind of nice in general, but obviously not ideal, like you said, yeah. to be up that that late. But what was it like working? I mean, he's totally not tuning in right now. What was it like working with uh, with Rob AJG? Oh, a nice guy. I'd never met him before. Uh, just I want your real thoughts. Come on. <laughs> no, I'm saying like he really is like a nice guy. I, I, he has a lot to say, like a lot to talk about. Uh, interesting perspective coming from like a different esport. Um, he helped a lot with like the the organization because we play as kind of a hey casters analyst. What do you guys think about the schedule? What should we do? And then he was the one that was kind of the intermediary person. So uh, that was overall nice to have somebody else take care of that kind of stuff. And yeah. uh, also just all around uh, had some interesting talks with him about life stuff. You know that that's the cool thing about getting in like tight-knit community of casters and analysts is that you slowly begin to develop relationships to the point that you're actually just having like every tournament is almost flowing from one to the other in the sense that when you start the next tournament you're you're just continuing off from where you left or continuing from where you left off so that's like a really cool thing and he kind of just naturally settled into the whole to the whole group so uh it was it was nice. It was nice like to have a new face, but also it's always nice to see the, the same face. 
familiar face. Good to hear, good to hear. All right, well, again, as far as the event went, sounds like you had some fun there behind the scenes, even as well as on camera, of course, getting some good experience in. The event itself, though, it was, it, it not only, again, production-wise, was it great, but the, the matches, we definitely had some very solid matches throughout the tournament, and uh, a, an interesting result in the sense that we had the team win it that we definitely predicted going into it, being Nigma, of course, and uh, so they're, they're going to be going to the major as a result, but... It wasn't maybe as easy of a road as we thought it was going to be for Nigma by any means. Yeah, I guess they had looked a bit shaky in the qualifiers, and they obviously looked a bit shaky in the first group stage games, but they managed to squeak it out, and they did that at TI-9 as well, where they just started in the lower sure. bracket and got second. So clearly this team is really good at grouping through a meta and figuring out the patch whatever patch they may be in throughout the course of the tournament. So good on them overall. I mean, at the end of the day, they got the results. That's all that really matters, right? Uh, going into the major, I think they drastically improved a lot over the course of the tournament, but I don't think they are good enough yet. Like in terms of they have not made it to the point where I'd be confident in them winning or placing top four in the major. I think as of now, I put them in the middle of the pack and they are capable of growing much higher than that. So that's what I'm kind of predicting for that team individually going into the major. And, uh, you know, I'll segue into our next point. On the opposite side, you have RNG, who looks like yeah. freaking studs in the group stage and even the first round of the playoffs and kind of just collapsed. I think this all shows what experience does. You see the how Enigma, despite their slow start, kind of – their experience just carried them, you know, what it takes to win a tournament, what it takes to adjust. On the other side, you have a bunch of young, skilled players captained by, um, you know, players like Super on RNG, and it just results in what we saw. I think Setsu made some really questionable plays as the tournament went on, and that had a lot, like, those types of plays had a lot to do with why RNG lost, just had games and managed to throw them away with a couple big feeds or a couple miscommunications yeah and sadly when you play against teams like team nigma that's just enough to lose so good they had a good showing they looked really good but uh and i think this team's got a nice bright future and they just fell short and that's how it goes yeah it's certainly nothing to be too disappointed about it's easier for us to say of course knowing how close they were to the major and how great they were looking going into those grand finals even ultimately then coming up short three to one in that series against nigma and the favorite team but uh, yeah nothing to be disappointed about certainly not the last time we're going to see rng and uh, certainly expect to see more of them down the line throughout the season as we continue on it's still still somewhat early on we're, we're not even at the halfway point yet when you really uh, break it down, of course, it's the second cycle right here of five total uh, that we have to come. So um, now another team that, of course, we were naturally curious about how they would perform being NA team after all the fighting pandas and what what to expect to them. Eternal Envy, the 50-50, whatever you want to say. They came out firing, man. They took out Nigma off the bat. So talking about Nigma's struggles a little bit. They defeated Nigma initially. They then lost to Gambit, though, in the winner's match of their group. And then they got the rematch ultimately dropping that series three game. So they got to play nine games in the group stages. Couldn't make it out though, man. That's yeah. Cool. I mean, uh, if you look at everyone else's group stage, like literally everyone else in the tournament uh, and you compare it to fighting pandas who played Nigma twice and gamut once, uh, that's like a pretty rough set of games to play in a group stage. Uh, just funny how that works out sometimes, but yeah, they, they were definitely somewhere between the fourth and fifth best team at that tournament. And, could have even placed like third or second, I think, if they made it to the playoffs. And that's just how the cookie crumbles, man. I don't really know what else to say. I mean, they're a bunch of good players, right? Like, yeah, we were course. talking about at the tournament. Everyone's talking about how they're just an NA team stack or whatever. But you got like, you got a TI winner in Owie, major winner in Moon Meander. You got Eternal Envy who's won majors. You got Snake King who's placed top eight at TI. You got um brile who's like one of the clearly one of the top five mid laners in the in the na region so by no means is that just a throw over or you know pushover team uh kind of give them more i think people are kind of giving them less than they deserve in terms of the credit of that roster and the accolades that it has uh so by no means did i expect them to give nigma as much of a run for their money as they did 
but I don't think that team's bad by any means. And I also think Nygma was worse than I expected them to be. So I think that was mainly what closed that gap. It wasn't yeah. fighting pandas being way better than I thought they were. I thought they were a solid team, but Nygma was just better and kind of Nygma proved to be slightly better in the end. But early on, as you said, they lost 2-1 to Fighting Pandas the first day of the tournament. Uh, that was scary <laughs> for Enigma fans, I'm yeah. sure. But uh, it's crazy to think that Enigma can go from losing their first best of three to winning the whole tournament. That's just – that's the format, and I think it's really <laughs> exciting. I think I really like the minor format after being at the minor itself and getting to okay. see it up close. So I, I really enjoyed that. I, I, I like the format. I, I will say, and to kind of go back to your point earlier, the condensed time is the one issue, though. The fact that it's in this case, especially uh, only having those four days, and clearly that was an issue, as we were pointing out, having the uh, one day go way late into the night. And not only for the cast, obviously as a cast, I also feel it for you guys, but you definitely got to feel for the players, too. And in the case, like, going back to Fighting Pandas, not to make an excuse for them, but they had to play the winner's match, which, again, they lost in a gr grueling three-game series against Gambit, and then they got a short break to then match up against Nigma in the elimination match right after. And that, that in itself is a pretty brutal format in the sense of timing. Ideally, teams like that get at least a little bit of a break, whether it's a series in between or then the following day. So that that's my one definitely uh, thing when it comes to the scheduling part of it. But again, the format itself, I, for the minor, I certainly think that, that it's fine. I'm, I'm not you know annoyed that it's a GSL format with only two teams advancing on. Getting to the minor is obviously a difficult task in the first place, but you know we got to figure out the teams eventually. It's also this also arguably gives these underdog teams slightly better chance as well. Is another way to look at it too. So I'm just fine with it. No, I, I a lot of people are complaining, you know, about or like even mentioning the complaints of the players being tired, playing late. I don't know, man. I I, I refuse to have sympathy in a lot <laughs> of ways. Gamers. The only sympathy I really have is that they have to go from one team to the next with no time to prep. That's like the yeah. main issue I have because it does require you to prep and then the, the opponent has been able to prep and they've also been watching you play. So the fact that they're playing late is not what bothers me. It's the fact that they're not allowed to prep. So sure. Uh, I'm of the opinion that if you are a gamer, you've spent 14 hours in a row playing pubs before. And while competitive <laughs> Dota is much more exhausting, like minute per minute uh, comparison uh, by no means should a Dota player not be able to play to 4 a.m. for two best of threes. It's not like they were playing four best of threes that day yeah. individually. You know what I mean? So that's true. It kind of just that kind of that, that's like a shit happens scenario, in my opinion. Could it have maybe been organized better? Sure. But that's also not my job. So uh, I also it's like the players knew what they were in for. It's not like they told them last minute. You know, they told them the day before they, they did tell them what the schedule was and they knew if they lost a gambit they were going to be playing next series and it's like just don't lose to gambit <laughs> just don't lose i mean yeah, come on you know, forehead. <laughs> that that easy uh, yeah. that, that is fair yeah it's again playing later into the night yeah I, i'm with you there i guess i don't necessarily have an issue with that it is like you said the lack of break maybe in between is is the one unfortunate thing but hey no excuses here enigma certainly deserving the victory uh, in the end, as far as the tournament goes. So uh, as far as the other side of things, again, we talked about how teams may be a little bit happy with their success in this event. On the other side, there were some teams, notably one, that uh, on the other NA side of things, uh, NIP, Ninjas in Pajamas, man, they, uh, they they had a rough, rough tournament, only getting to play two series. That's because they lost both of them 0-2, first to Geek Fam, and then in the follow-up in the elimination match to Team Spirit. Let's be honest. I mean, these are teams that on paper certainly – more so Team Spirit. I mean, Geek Fam is a solid squad. Yeah, the roster change going in, but still a solid squad, sure. But Team Spirit, definitely a team that they should be able to beat. Losing to O2, it almost felt like just NIP didn't even come to play to show up, frankly. Yeah, real quick before I complete my thoughts on NIP, in terms of performance from all teams, you know, just to close this time subject thing, people in chat are talking about it. They're saying, like, Asian teams got – it worse because it's like playing like 10 a.m. for them. It's like, oh, well, yeah. how about the nine o'clock series? Isn't that like playing for 2 a.m. for NA players? Yeah. Like you had, we all got there three days early. Like you had time to acclimate. Yeah. Like it was a huge padding between when we got there and when the tournament started. So 
you know, if you're a fan, if you're a player, get over yourself. Like you had three days and everyone had some sort of disadvantage in some series come to win, come to play. Like if you're making the excuse, you're tired. I, I got nothing for you. If players uh, were complaining about that, then yeah, I, I'm, I'm ho- wholeheartedly with you there. It's that should not be yeah, something that, that just, that's like, on a, them. Like, people also like to make comments from fans, like all oh, my region sure. or my team or like, you know, some other region have the advantage. Like the only people who had the advantage, if anything, were the people that are from that area, like the yeah. CIS teams. But then there's plenty of lands where it's in China, you know, and like the CIS teams are on an eight hour different time difference. And it's like, it happens all the time. But like you had three days. So next majors in NA, baby. To NIP, like disappointment to the max. You know, I talked to Gunner a bit um, on the plane ride. We actually had the same, he lives in Connecticut and I'm back in New York. So mm-hmm. We both flew into JFK, same flight, same bus, had quite a journey together. <laughs> uh, but I found out, I mean, he apparently got food poisoning the first day, which was pretty brutal for him. Uh, so he was like apparently in sweating when he was playing the game. Uh, by no means was he using that as an excuse, but you know, he, he was one. like, man, I, he basically was like, yeah, I know I did not play optimally. And it sucked to know that like, I maybe could have played better if it weren't for that. Um, and he also told me that the team decided to take the holidays off and they only boot camp for like two days before the tournament. And for me, I'm just like, yeah, that's not an excuse, but you're also like not going to do well if you do that. So, uh, you know, there's experienced veterans on that team. And maybe after playing 10 years of competitive Dota or, or Han or whatever, they're just tired of not having any time to spend with friends and family. And so it's all yeah. priorities, uh, but the teams that boot camp like RNG for and like played leagues for the two or three weeks before the tournament compared to that are just going to play way better. And NIP has been a constant disappointment throughout the course of the year uh, so far. And I, I'm kind of because of what I talked to him about. I'm kind of like, okay, let's see how they do at the next qualifiers. But I'm skeptical. It's a healthy amount of skepticism okay. towards what they can accomplish because they haven't proven to me anything of significance with the roster they have uh so far yeah. uh, like you yeah. know even though universe and pbd are world-renowned players in their respective positions what have you done for me lately yeah exactly <laughs> it's 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 almost brutal thing to say but it's on it you know when when the game is shifting so much i mean we just had a massive patch right the game changed a lot of ways and not to say that I can't translate over obviously it has for many players but you do have to constantly keep up and i think that's a very very fair criticism you're bringing up and the idea if you're going to be a team that's trying to take this seriously compete especially i mean this is a minor three hundred thousand dollars on the line it's a lot of money and for somebody like ppd that may not be as much you know being a former ti winner he's obviously had a lot of success and again this is all theory crafting or i I don't have any evidence necessarily to to back this up that uh but almost kind of going off what you're suggesting too that you know a player like ppd may not be as interested in really practicing and competing as much as a player like gunner who is definitely hungry and who's newer to the scene and ready to compete so i can completely see that scenario being realistic um again i don't have any evidence to back that up but I, i definitely think that's something to keep an eye on and think about now one more thing on this nip subject i will say without giving sources uh uh, but I do have a reason to believe NIP may not be a NIP team that we know uh, coming up here in the near future. Uh, it, that's it, it's very possible. Um, you, you've talked Meaning about the a, organization uh, or the roster. Well, the roster itself. Uh, I, I, I I can't say I've really gone deep into it, but I have reason to believe that, uh, that the roster itself is certainly not going to be the same um, come the next minor. And I don't think that really is the, the most surprising thing, though, to suggest, right? Like this is a team that replaced Skitter after they qualified. They replaced him with Tanner. Tanner taking a mid and, and really someone knew a player himself. Uh, then that moved Gunner to the position one. And that in itself kind of felt odd. And now that as you're suggesting the fact that they only played a couple of days before, really, as far as the tournament goes with a completely new roster. I mean, come on, S- something's just not right there. And it's almost unfair to players like a Gunner, who I said is like maybe hungry, really wants this. And the others, maybe not as much. Again, I don't know exactly what is going on behind the scenes, but uh, like I go back to certainly believable scenarios. 
you want to all say? i know like I, I i you know you have to find the right balance of how much do i talk about that i've talked about with the players because if i talk about stuff that's personal obviously they're just never going to talk to me again i just know that with skeeter specifically there were personality issues like people just didn't get along in terms of how they view dota um as well as just in general like personality conflicts and that happens in teams sometimes and i know peter is really reluctant to kick players based on like his past you know with uh even in rough times with team optic and uh last year's nip he never kicked a player so uh just to be clear he's not going to kick you just because he thinks you're underperforming like that's not enough he's going to kick you for reasons that he thinks are irrecoverable and uh the personality conflicts on a team are just that uh like if you don't see eye to eye as people it's just not going to work right like that doesn't change you know somebody's not going to change their personality over day overnight i mean uh so i will say that i mean just regardless of what's happening behind the scenes and what any of us know i i I thought they were going to change rosters but at least one player because of how badly they did but uh yeah, I'll, I'll just wait and see with that one. I, exactly. I wouldn't be surprised either way. Based on what I've been told, I wouldn't be surprised if they decide to stick it out for one more major minor cycle. But I also wouldn't be terribly surprised at all if one or two, maybe even three players are gone from that team. So. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. And uh, got the major coming up after the major, as usual. Perhaps roster changes to come. Maybe even multiple teams. You never really know. But definitely want to keep an eye on uh, moving forward there. So... All right, as far as the minor goes, I don't know if there's much else to say. Uh, you know, covering uh, the the what was necessary there. Enigma, again, the champions, and we'll be in the major coming up. So, um, well, another direction we did want to go, actually, before we do move on, was always fun to, to kind of look at the meta. And, and of course, this was not the first post-patch, uh, but it, it was the first DPC event post-patch. Of course, uh, we did have the one before that you also were a part of in Singapore there. But this also helped give us a, even a better idea of maybe Maybe what to expect coming up just around the corner when it comes to the major. Uh, taking a look at some of these stats here, notably the number one pick tier, Rubik, actually on top of the list by a comfortable margin, had about a 50% win percentage, so nothing really too crazy there, I think. But one of the first things that actually stood out to me when looking just simply from a stats point of view was Phantom Lancer. Phantom Lancer kind of jumped up as far as a core, not coming out of nowhere by any means, but I don't know if a lot of people would have necessarily guessed PL to be the top pick safe lane core coming in and he was eight and two record as far as uh, his overall win record goes so pretty successful there no i mean i knew pl was going to be good this patch i didn't know if he was going to be when i say good i mean whenever pl is good he's picked you know it's kind of one of those heroes that you either see a pretty good amount of them or none of them um but usually in the past good enough for pl meant third fourth pick in the draft earliest and this tournament, we saw, obviously, like you said, some first-rounded PLs. Um, yeah, I mean, I think he's just really good against the meta right now. He's good against Lich. He's good against Tree. He's good against Rubik. He's good against Disruptor. He's good against Abaddon. Uh, even pretty decent against Omni Knight. And he's good against Drow. He's good against Venge. And uh, good against Batrider. I'm, I'm naming, like, eight of the top <laughs> ten picked heroes in the tournament right now. So, uh, the fact is, when you're a hero that's good against what's good and you're numbers are respectably decent like you're gonna be really good (laughs) like that's just i'm not saying his numbers are not op or anything i'm just saying that his numbers are definitely good enough in terms of just like base stats abilities that kind of stuff to be viable and then on top of that he's good against what's good so sure the fact is when you're a hero that's good against what's good people have to pick out of meta weaker heroes to counter you and that just never feels good so uh it has to be like a very niche situation and it's hard to lose the draft and i also noticed this tournament that teams were able to make comebacks much easier and they were also able to stall out games very well uh and pl is one of the perfect heroes to capitalize on that meta uh so overall the meta for the tournament that i learned a lot about was teammate or teams abilities to make comebacks despite what everyone seems to believe about this patch being really snowball-y as well as, you know, almost impossible to come back. Mm -hmm. And I saw countless teams be up by five to 10,000 gold before 25 minutes and lose. So I think part of that has to do with the quality of the teams, but I also think some of those games were very good Dota and it was not a hundred percent on the team winning 
that just and that ruined it, right? So yeah. I think that's really nice going forward um, for a meta. I think that's a very good dynamic to have in Dota. And uh, I overall enjoyed seeing teams get better as the game as the games went on. And here are like PLs kind of just realizing, oh, we can do this in this meta. Okay, so like PL wasn't picked all that much at the start of the tournament, but suddenly people are picking him so much in the in the later portions, and I think that says a lot about the meta when you see that kind of thing. And I know I just went on a massive tangent about PL, but <laughs> it does good. really summarize a lot about the tournament, so I wanted to make sure I got that in there. Definitely. Uh, yeah, and then kind of going back to your point quickly, too, about the some of the matches and the comeback there. And uh, there was, there was well, I was trying, trying to find it now, but I know Nygma, they were down like 40,000. that were Yeah, they, one Drog and Spectre, and yeah. they won. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, it's it's certainly possible. <laughs> it is certainly possible in this patch, and uh, definitely a great example right there uh, from this minor that we had. So, uh, so yeah, there was Phantom Lancer, as, as mentioned. Um, Io, for me, was another one that kind of stood out because I, I remember even in the previous event, we had mentioned how Io was one of the not picked, or I don't even know if he got banned many times, if at all, in the uh, the one esports tournament that we had just prior to this. And kind of a notable one for sure, but... All of a sudden, here this miner was picked eight times, kind of in the middle, uh, above average, and what seven and one record. So I was just banned all the other games. Yeah, exactly. So I was back. Uh, apparently, not like it was picked less than these other heroes uh, for any other reason uh, than the fact that it was banned every game. Yeah. Uh, I, I think the neutral items are too good on IO. I think that's part of what makes IO way like puts them over the edge this patch i really will say like io's kit's been for like the you know they go for the 404 max farm max overcharge build uh but i think what really makes and breaks this hero is the fact that some of the neutral items are just so broken uh you know late game we saw like craggy i saw like a craggy coat essence ring witless shako five position io and it just has like three thousand health How do you kill that yeah 20 armor and a extra 650 heal for their core it's like that's just bonkers you know i hope they do make a patch before the next tournament or before the major i really hope they do something to do with neutral items really uh, like limiting one per hero something like that you think before the major uh, even i would like to see it personally wow. i think the neutral items are really cool but i do think uh after seeing the ios as well as the huskars kind of a breakout hero of the tournament also was huskar uh, got picked a lot more than I thought, especially by Enigma, who won it all. Yep. And there was just one game where he had like Craggy Coat, Paladin Sword, and like Mindbreaker, and it was just game changing. That a, 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 a Huskar that all he had was like Phase Armlet Halberd <coughs> suddenly could participate in fights as like a menace because he had three neutral items, and I think that's like a problem. I do think that balance of the game is a problem. I think teams are purposely starting to pick one hero that would go like double Wraith Band wand in terms of the mid lane uh, uh, safe lane. They'd have one hero that did like the double Wraith Band wand or double null wand. And then the other core was a core that doesn't do that where it's like they go straight for one or two big items and then all the neutral items are dumped onto the one core. And it was a very interesting yeah. meta shift. You, if you actually look back at the drafts, it was really cool to notice at the end of the tournament that almost every team was starting to have one core that purposely had one or two big items and the other core had a bunch of small ones it was kind of interesting there's so many tangents i can go off of with that too and i don't want to you know i don't yeah, want to be careful right because <laughs> it, it is interesting what you said about the idea of even having a patch between the minor and the major i'm sitting here trying to think about how i feel about that personally because obviously th we did have a patch come out right before the minor and that in itself is, is a little bit okay you know kind of caught off guard there but there were certainly some heroes, heroes were still picked. <laughs> exactly like puck and you know whatever they were certainly uh noteworthy um, nerfs and definitely needed, but it's still, as you just pointed out, I mean, they were still picked. Whether that's because of the lack of time to adapt to it, I mean, who knows, I guess, in the end, but it feels like, yeah, the, the heroes are still certainly relevant uh, for sure. So I, I just, it is tough for me to grasp this idea of making changes off of a minor, an 18 minor, 
with w one week in between to then make changes and then have the 16 team major take place. I, I feel like just play it out, you know, whether or not it's a little bit more RNG heavy than we like. It goes back to the logic that we said before, right? Where just because there is more randomness in the game, it doesn't necessarily mean it, teams can still work around that to an extent. Very, I bring up the poker analogy all the time. Yes, poker is very random, but putting yourselves in the best positions to take advantage of said randomness is where the teams are definitely going to shine. And going back to your point that you were just suggesting there with teams and how they were working it out uh, when it came to the minor play. So, you know, I'm sure these major teams are certainly watching that as well. Going to take the, some insight there. And now we'll have a major with 16 teams, more match, many more matches to be played. Then we'll really be able to analyze where the game is at and then make changes accordingly, I feel like. We'll, we'll certainly going to be something, I, I feel like, because maybe the randomness is a little bit too much. But um, let's have the major first. And then see where we're at, I think. I'm fine with that approach, too. But I also, like, I, I wouldn't mind if they just decided, hey, like, we've seen enough of these neutral items being, like, just too much with the with the RNG. But, hey, yeah. I, I, either way, like like you said, if, if they leave it as is, teams know that. They'll just draft accordingly. Sometimes you'll have game-breaking luck. But for the most part, 90% of Dota games, the RNG of the neutral items has very little to no impact on the winner. So Hey, Samael loves it. Yeah, I mean, I still love the mechanic. I, I love the mechanic. I think it's super fun and good for the game, but I think, you know, every mechanic introduced, you know, just like when Shrines came out, I think Shrines were fine for Dota, but when they came out with two outside of in base and five inside of yeah. base, that's like insane, right? So tone it down a little bit in terms of how much impact it has, but leave them in the game. So. Well, and we know that Ice Frog and the Balance team is certainly not afraid to make changes when, like, they, they obviously went over the top with this patch, and it was fun to see, but... They're not they're not afraid to, to tone it down when when needed and yeah I'm sure neutral chains neutral item changes are coming again post major I would be my bet for that so okay all right major speaking of that major uh, unless there's anything else stat wise that you wanted to no nah, man I you know I've talked out of my ass all right <laughs> so, let's move on. I've done that plenty here with the the minor that you're at so the major that we got coming out this is Dream League officially of course uh, that's going to be happening Dream League season thirteen. The Leipzig Major, Leipzig, I think I'm pronouncing that right. Anyways, it's going to be there. And, uh, of course, as mentioned, 16 teams competing. One of those 16 teams is uh, going to be TNC. Uh, TNC, of course, the previous major winners. Now, there was a little asterisk there in terms of we didn't have all the teams that we expected or – not necessarily expected, but you get the point. You know, we didn't have Secret. We didn't have OG, et cetera. Ex-Liquid and crew. Uh, we, we at least have uh, most of those teams now. Uh, well, I guess it's kind of hack because it's uh, <laughs> it's the Ex-Liquid, Enigma, and then Secret. Uh, LGD, of course, didn't even qualify for the minor. And then uh, you had OG not playing once again. But point is, definitely a bit, bit of a step up. And with this big patch and everything, expectations for TNC. Is this uh, Does this feel like a patch that maybe is going to be – Good for them, and uh, perhaps uh, a good result here. I don't think so. So no. far, they haven't proven that they can play the meta heroes. Like I feel that they were owning with the, what they did last patch, and what they did was just play the heroes better than other people. Like they were so much better at Morph Shaker. They had like they were really the only team that really knew how to play carry Night Stalker to its optimal potential. And they just had three or four strats last patch that seemed that they just were above and beyond the skill and execution at those specific strats than all the other teams. And I don't know if they're going to be able to do that uh, coming into this next tournament. I, I think that was really their main advantage. And clearly, based on the Singapore event, the heroes that are meta right now are not their best strong suit. So they either had to drastically improve on those heroes or they had to figure out a way to counter those heroes with heroes of their own that are good enough. Uh, you know, at the start of the patch, heroes like Venno were really good or considered good, and that was like a KP special, but now not so much. I, as of now, I think they do have a lot to prove, uh, as TNC to me at least. Uh, I would put them somewhere between like 6th to 12th. You know, I think 6th okay. would be about as good as I give them, and 12th would be hopefully as bad as they would do. So yeah, that's about where I put them. Okay. Um, as far as myself goes, I you know this is a team that not I didn't take away their success at the first major, but I certainly was not afraid to suggest, and I and I still kind of stand there in the sense that 
I just don't know if I can see the continued momentum with them. Now, that was before this big patch came out. It's a somewhat chaotic patch with with the neutral items and objectives and everything. And, you know, who's to say they, they can't find those specific niche meta heroes that, uh, that they're going to be the ones to lead the way? Um, it's certainly possible. I, I definitely still want to stand by, though, what I what I said with the, after the first major right there. So I'm not going to necessarily change. One thing I do want to bring up, though, is that just, uh, God, was it yesterday even or maybe even early today? They officially announced Febby is going to be their new coach. Uh -huh. So, yeah, I mean, honestly, a very smart player, of course, with great history himself. Uh, good he's dance got, moves. Good dance moves, apparently. So definitely is something to look for there if you happen to be at the major. Um, <laughs> no, but uh, Febby is uh, going to bring his knowledge to the team. And, and I find it interesting that he's coming in a little bit later on where, you know, we're less than a week away in terms of the major starting. So I, I, he could still certainly have great impact there. But it's, it's maybe a little less time than you would hope for in terms of picking up a, a solid coach and really getting you ready for a tournament. So, again, I, I think that helps. I definitely still don't have the highest expectations. I, I, I kind of agree with you. The middle of the pack sounds about right to me. If they if they manage to even get a top three finish, let alone win the whole thing, I, I, I will honestly be very, very shocked at that. But You've been kind of skeptical about them the entire year, even yeah. like saying like even though they won this major, you're not too convinced. So exactly. I, this will be the – Either coming of your prophecy or the, you know. <laughs> or I might as well life. retire. Cause yeah, they, exactly. They got me there. It's a, it's anything is possible, certainly. But no, I am going to stand by what, what, I, what I said before. And I uh, think that. I respect uh, that. Unfortunately. Good. Exactly. Unfortunately, the struggles may continue. But again, Febby's solid coach for sure for them. Uh, so we'll look to see what he's able to provide there for the team. Uh, another thing to kind of look at as far as. Uh, Speaking of that, kind of, I mean, wh which teams have the most to prove in this event? Again, we're dealing with 16 teams here. Nigma, the 16th, just qualifying from the minors. Is there any that come to mind as far as, you know, which team's going to this where they need, not necessarily to win it all, but just really need a good result to show that, okay, here they are finally. Uh, the number one teams that I, uh, the, the general description I'm going to give of the teams I think have something to prove are the teams that I think are supposed to be at the top and haven't proven that yet or the teams that are capable uh and i believe that they could be but they could also flop um so first off i think team nigma first and foremost from the minor uh see what they can do carrying forward uh, obviously second place ti but what else can they do for me uh going into this major not just winning the minor like we've seen a lot of these minor teams go quite far yeah uh, even in the last two years or like a year and plus the first event this year uh, with IG, VG last year. So Enigma's one for me. Chaos Esports, I think they looked sick at the start of the year. You know, Quincy Crew, obviously they had some slow start, little issues going there. But I think they could easily get top four if they really just are as strong as I think they could potentially be. Um, uh, Virtus Pro, for the same reasons, it's kind of like Team Enigma, like an established team. That also hasn't really proven themselves this year. Yeah, they're like a new roster, but um, I think that they are yet to prove to me that they're solidified. Um, we already kind of talked about TNC, and then the other one for me would really be Alliance, um, just because they've kind of given like glimpses of greatness and glimpses of like kind of meh uh, throughout the course of this year so far. And I think this will kind of be for me that what – decides what side of the teeter totter is going to be is going to take over so sure. those are really my main teams that i'm looking out for to see how they do this tournament okay definitely uh you know somewhat repetitive here i, I agree on uh, most of those more so virtus pro more so than anything just because that name brand the name set that they bring to the table resolution of course still to this day one of the more notorious players and well-known players um so are, are they is vp finally actually back or you know will they will they have a bit of a struggle and of course a completely different roster so it, it, it's almost silly to put these high expectations on them from the previous years but the brand is still there. They still have a couple of players, of course, and no one in solo from the previous squad and, and certainly capable of, uh, of playing pretty well. So they definitely, for me too, uh, EG, I mean, hands down has to be, I still, and I know I say they don't necessarily have to win it, but man, in EG's case, I almost want to say they have to win this event. It's just something about this team, man. They, they continue to get so close, but when are they going to get over that hump? 
Will it finally be at this Dream League? Uh, I, I hope so for their sake. And may, may, maybe that'll really show us that this logo change was needed. Uh, because, hey, if they win after <laughs> the logo change, then everything goes away, right? So as far as the criticism there. So um, I'm sure some extra pressure from uh, behind the scenes there for them. No, but on a serious note, Team Secret, then the last team I wanted to bring up there on that topic. Again, this is a squad that fantastic last year, the number one team and during the regular season if you want to put it that way uh, for the DPC certainly some very high expectations understandably going into this season as well this is their first cycle they're playing didn't play the first cycle as mentioned uh, so I, I think it's important for them certainly to get off to a good start uh, here in this major and anything behind Anything less than a top four finish for a team like Team Secret, especially not competing in the first cycle, was uh, will be pretty disappointing uh, in my sure. mind. So that's what I got for them. All right. I agree with the fact that uh, teams like Team Secret have a lot to prove to in general. But like to me, I, I guess for them, I have a lot of faith. So sure. that's why I don't put them on my list kind of thing. Yeah. So for all I know, I could just be way wrong and they just botch out at eighth and I'd definitely be disappointed. But uh I, I just don't expect it. We'll just have to see it in that in that regard. That's the thing with this patch, though, man. It's again, we really it's so hard to gauge uh, this this being the first big tournament now, really since the since the patch in the sense of a major in a 16 team tournament, a lot of matches to be played. So we we, we certainly are going to finally now learn a lot about where the game is really at. So yes, high expectations a secret, and that is fair to, to state that yeah, you, you definitely kind of expect it anyway. So. Um, as far as the 16 teams in the event, uh, one of the things that, that is noteworthy as well, going kind of back to TNC, um, let, let's not forget, too, that in the Southeast Asian qualifiers, they actually almost didn't even qualify for the major. They had to play a third game uh, in their qualifiers in the third place match uh, against a team called Signal Ultra. Uh, who actually ended up DCing in that third game? <laughs> yes, T TNC was up, but still, it's like it, it was kind of crazy the fact that the defending major champions were on the verge of not even making the next major, but um, they did. And of course, anything can happen now. A lot of prep time since it's been what easily a month, month and a half since the qualifiers. Man, it feels like it's been so long since they took place. So it is crazy, huh? Yeah, what? How long? And that, actually, December first through the third. So. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been more than uh, almost a month and a half. It's a month and a half. It, that's that's okay. That's a little too uh, you know holiday break though. I mean, it, it happens, but man, that is a long freaking time. All right. Anyways, um, then another topic to go over is uh, yeah, if it, if it just creates any more discussion, but which team will be kind of the biggest surprise at this event? Uh, maybe maybe one that we're not necessarily on the radar as much, but uh, you kind of already touched on it a little bit, I guess, in chaos, right? Like chaos is maybe a team that's coming up quickly as far as the ranks go and not only a bit to prove, but maybe a surprise if they do well for a lot of people. Uh, you, you think it's going to be surprised if they do well? I think it will be. Yeah. I mean, okay. I, I don't care what success they've had in the qualifiers. It's not getting to this point. And this, this is a different ball game, right? I mean, you're playing against the best of the best in the world now on the world stage and a team that, uh, you know, had struggles in the first cycle here. So I, uh, I, I would be surprised. I, I really would if they managed to have a, let's say, a top six finish. Interesting. Okay. I, I give them a lot of cred. So I, 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 I'll, you know, one of us is going to be wrong. That's, <laughs> that's, I guess. That, yeah. That's always nice, right? You know, and, but also, Breaky, what that means is one of us is going to be right. And if 50-50 for being right, that's better odds than I usually got. So there you go. I'll take it. There you go. All right. So, of course, the uh, the South American teams, too. It's always kind of fall into this right as far as a surprise team goes. But uh, certainly Beast Coast is, as always, one to look out for. Uh, so we'll see uh, from them, too. But uh, the the major starts. When does it start? It starts this weekend, right? Yeah, that's why we're doing the preview here. January 18th. So that would be Saturday. So, of course, when it comes to the major and the format, it's spread out a lot more. It's 18th through the 26th. So it starts this Saturday. It goes all the way into the following Sunday. Um, it's uh, as the format has been decided by Valve and the DPC. You have the four GSL group stages, best of three. Uh, everyone advances on. It's top two to the winner side, bottom two to the lower bracket, and then best of one in this round. It's, it's pretty much the TI format in that sense uh, as far as advancing on there. So, um, yeah, a lot of matches to be played and uh, some damn good Dota that we get to be watching here coming up. Always look forward to these big-time tournaments, especially after a big patch. So, 
Not much else to say other than uh, let's do the ultimate prediction, right? Like, who, who's going to win this thing? It's an easy guess. I mean, no. 16 teams, anything can happen with this patch. If you had to predict one, one team, though, who would it be, BSJ? If I had to pick, predict one team, it would be hmm. – I've been thinking about this, and I it's been a tough one because I've kind of tossed up amongst three or four teams. But I'm, I'm going to predict – I'm going to go with Vici. I'm going to go with Vici. <laughs> And if my one sleeper pick to make me look like a genius, if it happens, is chaos. Wow. Uh, yeah. Like out of all teams that nobody would predict a win, no, that's my team. I, that's I certainly win. wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, that's. Yeah, I know. I know we already have that. It isn't just to slam this in your face. Like, I, 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 they're the team that has the most approved to me because I think they're either going to get 12 or they're going to be like super dope. And they're just going <laughs> to like make a huge run at this tournament. So they're like the J storm of last tournament. I feel like we said the yeah, same well, thing about them. Well, the thing about J storm was to be completely honest. I knew they had zero chance to win the tournament. Like whether or not they get fourth, sixth, eighth, 10th, 12th, whatever, they're not going to win. But like chaos, I think has a non zero percent chance to win this tournament. So that's why I'm leaving them as my like, crazy pick a to, sleeper, to crazy potentially pick. take okay. it what about you Greg? what do you well, think you know i was it's, i kind of chuckled a little bit when he said peachy game because i i was actually going to say them too I, and and i hate to say that because you know it's here we are two wow, guys nice and, nice cop out i know answer, right there. <laughs> just the cop out answer but i i I've always can I continue I continue to be impressed by Vici Gaming I still to this day I've been saying this for the last couple of years I still think they arguably have the best one-two punch as far as their position one and position two players in Euros aka Paparazzi and Ori um, and when you got that working for you it's it certainly tournament victory is is a very real grasp for them so um, I, I'm, I, I am going to go with Vici Gaming as well as far as I kind of like the idea of that that sleeper pick there uh, and who can maybe uh, surprise us all. And, you know, <laughs> it's, it, I always, I'm always troubled with it because the same thing happens with me with back in the day with complexity as well. I've been a complexity fanboy for the longest time, and and I've done it before with them, and they just completely flop. And You guys can predicting complexity to do well. Yeah, you know all about Sorry. that, right? So uh, Team Liquid, though, is uh, is, is going nice. to be it for me. So I'm, I'm going to do it again if we had to do it. Let's go, Team Liquid Han boys. They're going to not do it. Oh, boy. I just jinxed them. I'm sorry, guys. No, I, it's – this is still a team that I, I've been so happy to see their progress through the years. But, man, it's like just when they start really getting good, it just seems like it flops once again. So they got Blitz as a coach, so very, very smart individual, of course, especially when it comes to Dota. So I, I think he's going to be having his boys prepared. And Sandy, a great captain, and uh, certainly the skill is there. If they could just stop throwing games, please. Stop the throwing. All right, Stop there picking go. Gyro. Stop picking Jarl. Stop. Uh, stop doing silly things. Post thirty minutes into the game and thinking they have the win when you don't, etc. There you go. All right. Um, yeah, I'm excited though, man. It's uh, so again that kicks off this Saturday. Certainly going to be uh, looking forward to watching it. And uh, next week's show, we're going to come back and kind of review at least how the initial start of the event uh, went. That'll be the plan, I suppose, when it comes to that. But. I think that uh, pretty much does it, though, as far as not only the preview of the major, but in general, as the podcast uh, this episode goes. Anything else uh, on your mind there, BSJ? I've, I'm good, man. I think we're ready to see what happens in the major and talk about impressions next week. I'm looking forward to seeing what I learned from the minor, kind of translating into what the major teams do, whether or not it's just completely different and all the minor teams are trash. Or if I kind of see some remnants of what I learned and what I think all the other teams also learned at the minor. So I'm curious. I'm really fascinated to see how much of that translates to Tier 1, Tier 2 Dota. The continued evolution of the patch. It's always uh, one of the many great things about watching a game like competitive Dota. And uh, certainly going to be plenty of that here 
uh, to expect and to, and to be entertained by starting this Saturday. So really want to thank you guys for tuning into the podcast. Uh, be sure to let your friends know, let, let, let others know that uh, the show does exist. We definitely uh, have been uh, doing a pretty good job, I feel like, of keeping the show going throughout the season, even at the start of the season there. Speak for yourself. <laughs> All right. Uh, but, no, it's uh, it, it's been a lot of fun and uh, always great to talk, Dota. Hopefully you guys are enjoying it. And uh, we already expect to see you next week and looking forward to it. So enjoy the major, guys. We'll see you next week. Until then, have a good night. <laughs>